Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Vibha Dhawan from Terry. Today we are going to talk on the module Micropropagation, Current Status and Future Prospects under the paper on Plant Biotechnology and Crop Improvement. Now in last few modules, you have learnt about micropropagation. What the technology is, what are the potential of micropropagation and that we are practicing it for over 60 years now. From 1960s onwards, we are multiplying plants by tissue culture technology. But even today, when we look at our country, the success is limited to few species. We are doing banana, perhaps total production of banana uh, accounts for almost 80% of the total production by tissue culture technology. And remaining 20% are ornamental plants and plants like pomegranate and so on. But we are still not successful with important species like mango and so on. So what we would like to discuss is what are the problems associated with micropropagation? Why we are not doing it for every species? So those problems are recalcitrance of species, some many of the important species, we still do not have working protocols, contamination of field grown material that still remains an issue, there is browning of the media, important species like mango, it is very difficult or rather next to impossible to regenerate cultures, we succeed in species like palms but again the rate of growth is so slow that you do not have economically viable protocols. You also get plants which are abnormal, especially after repeated cycles, the so-called offshoot, off types. And then many plants, in many protocols, we still do not have plants which survive with high frequency outside, uh, outside to the, uh, in nature. So there again, you, there, there is a problem. And last but not the least is the high cost of plantlet production because ultimately everything boils down to economics. Can I afford it? This plant is very good. But if it is four times the cost of seed raised plants, then I have to see advantage of technology before I shift to tissue culture technology. So we will learn about some of these problems. We will also learn where we are in terms of commercialization and what we can expect in years to come. Now there are large number of species which are for which we have tissue culture protocols. In fact, if you look at the research in late 80s, early 90s, it was largely on developing tissue culture protocols and students for their PhD, they were choosing one species or the other in developing that entire protocol for tissue culture. Then it was found that many of these protocols were research protocols. They were good to produce few hundred plants but not millions of plants. And as you have learnt in entire module, in entire paper is that it is very, very species and genotype specific technology. And unfortunately for tissue culture, Many important species such as mango, palms, we still do not have protocols which are commercially viable or rather I will say even we do not have the protocols, we cannot regenerate from the adult phase when you actually identify plant for the desirable traits. Now what happens especially in perennials is that with age the plant loses its capacity to regenerate. It is also true for the vegetative method of propagation. For example, if you have to take cuttings, the plants in the juvenile phase are far more responsive than in the adult phase. But fortunately, there are procedures available whereby you can rejuvenate an adult tree. One of that technology is that you cut it at the stump and then you start getting shoots which we call as coppice. And these coppice shoots, they are excellent material both for inducing vegetative cuttings as well as for taking explants. Similarly, repeated spray of growing shoots with cytokinins 
that gives you explants which are far more responsive. They already have endogenous level of cytokinin built up, the type it requires, as well as because of its fast growth, they are more juvenile. Now, another problem is that of contamination. See, in tissue cultures, we say tissue culture produce plants free of diseases. But tissue culture of its own cannot remove any disease. It's also a problem when you collect explants, especially in the initiation stage, because what you do is you sterilize the explant exogenously. You apply sterilant outside. So if any contaminant is endogenously present, you can't get rid of it. But yes, surely it's a great means to identify such plants and don't bring them into cultures. But when I say exogenous, now sterilant should be such that it should kill the microbes, but it should be soft to the tissue itself. But if the microbial count is very high or the type of spores which are present on the explant or the explant structure itself, like suppose there are leaf folds, then the contaminants can be inside as well. For example, if you have to initiate banana from suckers, which is an underground portion, then it's going to be really difficult and your success rate can be as low as 1 to 2 percent. So starting with underground tissue is always a problem. When you deal with adult budwood material, even that is a problem because your growing shoot is always exposed to viruses, bacteria and so on. And Usually, we also say that you get best explants during the growing period, which is rainy season. And again, you all know that during rains, the microbial count is high. So bringing such cultures at the initiation stage itself, your success rate can be very low. It's very problematic, especially when you're dealing with the material, which is in short supply. You're dealing with suckers and so on. So of the identify, because you identify a plus tree with lot of labor. And if you are unable to initiate cultures from it, it becomes a very expensive exercise to go back to that tree again and then bringing the explants and so on. And you may fail also. And especially if there is any endogenous bacteria, endogenous fungi, you have to discard all your explants. Let me also share with you that we get, we say disease-free plants but it becomes extremely important for you to test them for known viruses and you'll be learning more about it in the later module on virus elimination. So prior to explant collection, we also take certain precautions such as the plants must be watered at the soil level. You shouldn't splash water because then it also takes microbes along with it or rather drip is even better. And then you can also think of covering the growing shoot with loose polythene so that the growing shoots are not exposed to the outside environment. We also use sprays such as those with bacteriostatic substances so that the bacterial growth or the bacterial count on the shoots from which explants are to be collected, that gets reduced. And you have learned already about it in the chapter earlier, which is the stage zero. So these are the stage zero precautions which are taken to get clean explants. So once you have raised aseptic cultures, thereafter they must be maintained in clean environment. And that clean environment consists of your inoculation room, growth rooms, and when you carry out any operation, say inside the laminar airflow, you need to avoid any spread of diseases. So what we normally do is we keep clean area, absolutely, especially in larger facilities, we keep clean area separated from the non-clean area. So once you have initiated clean cultures, your next point is that these cultures should multiply in a clean environment. So what can be the factors which can contribute towards it? It's the humans, those who are working with these clean cultures. So those who are working in the non-clean area, they should have restricted entry. And of course, that's only possible if you have 
large operations. It's not possible in small operations. And then when they enter, then there is a sort of air curtain. So, and they wear lab coats, they cover their hair with the cap and so on. So that nothing from their body also falls into the media because media is rich in all inorganic, inorganic salts and so on. So therefore, you want all the personnel who are working with these cultures, they should maintain high level of hygiene and they should be working with the clean instruments. We also, when we prepare the media that is autoclave to sterilize it, we use double doors so that there is, you open the autoclave on in the clean area and you store media for three days minimum so as to ensure that the autoclave cycle was proper. And whatever material that needs to be used, that is usually not brought as a material, but through pass windows, which have UV fitted on it so that you put it on one side from non-clean area, put on the UV light, and thereafter you open from the other side and take your material that is to be used in the clean area. So the clean area in large facilities, that has a separate entry. And not just a separate entry, those who are working there, in a way, they take off their street shoes, they wash their feet, they wash their hands, it's, it's a sterilant, with a sterilant, they dry it, it's not that they use towel, but they actually uh, uh, dry it through dryers, and then they enter into the clean area after passing through an air curtain. So in a way, one is taking all possible precautions that the microbes which are present on their street clothes may not get entry into the media. So it's air curtain and wearing lab coats on top of it. Thereafter, when the, uh, those who are working inside the clean area, uh, or especially in the inoculation room, uh, we take further precautions. First of all, there should be no dirt soil inside that room. And therefore, these rooms usually they don't have any windows. So it's absolutely closed structure. The walls of these rooms, that is with plastic paint, so no dust can accumulate on it. And frequently with, we uh, spray them with rectified spirit and uh, we wipe them so that if there is any microbe present, it gets killed. Then inside the lamina airflow cabinet where the actual manipulations are carried out, there you need to maintain highest possible sterility level. So those who are working there, they wipe their hands, whatever portion is going inside with rectified spirit repeatedly. You give cuts on either sterile paper or sterile plates and after each operation, you discard them. They are washed and reused, but you discard them after each use. The instruments which are used, they are put in glass bead sterilizer where temperature is close to 200 degrees centigrade. So if you leave it over there, if there is any microbe which has gone undetected by your eyes, that gets killed. Any culture which is given for further subculture, that also passes through experienced eye. So every culture is to be observed and then given to the operator who is working over there. So that all these precautions are basically that there is no spread of disease. So if one culture get contaminated and suppose you are careless, you will be making from that mother cultures maybe four or five cultures. If you are not careful in washing or in getting uh, uh, get the instrument sterilized, then you will be spreading it to the next jar as well. So you have to be extremely careful uh, over here. Let me also mention that those who are working in the clean area, those staff members are not even permitted uh, to go to the garden and come there again because plants, they carry large number of microbes. And we don't want that, suppose they go out for lunch there and then when they come back and they carry lots of uh, my, microbes as well as insects with them which can create havoc into a tissue culture lab. 
But what happens is after 20 or 30 or 40 subcultures, one fine day you will find that this bacteria is now visible. And at that stage, you don't know what to do. It may not be harmful to the plant, because, but then no one will buy such plants because they don't know whether it is harmful or it's not harmful or it can actually be harmful. So everything goes haywire because you have multiplied plants for a buyer or you have multiplied plants for selling and you can't sell it and you don't know what to do. So what is now happening is that once you have established cultures, you test them on bacterial media. You actually start growing them on the media which promotes bacterial growth. So if any bacteria appears, then you discard those cultures right in the beginning rather than waiting till the end. Another cr common problem associated especially with adult budwood material is leaching of phenols. Now phenols otherwise they are, it's a protective mechanism by the plant. So here when you collect X plant, you give a cut. So then these phenols, they get leached from the X plant. Phenols are not bad, but once they get oxidized, they actually, they may lead to the death of the X plant. So this oxidative browning, which is very common in uh, adult budwood material, is restricting growth of this industry uh, for many important species. We are able to control it in some species. There are different chemicals right from that you collect the material and you uh, dip the cut-ins in ascorbic acid, uh, which does not uh, let these phenols oxidize. You incorporate PVP, uh, you activate it charcoal, that will adsorb these phenols, but then it has success in few species and this still proves to be a problem in many more species. The polyphenol exudation is impacted by many factors, age of the explant, season of explant collection, composition of the media, the way you have given a cut, because usually we use very sharp instruments and it should be just one sharp cut rather than a sort of that you are giving, injuring the explant repeatedly. So they all have impact on the exudation. Polyphenol exudation, as I said, that it's something which we cannot control in many species. So what we do many a times is that you collect the explant, bring it under with in uh, antioxidants. Uh, then you make the explants, giving them a sharp cut, and thereafter, you what you are doing is that you are avoiding the phenols to get accumulated. So what you do is you put it on a liquid media and then change it from one to the other very fast. So every day or every four hours, depending on the leaching intensity, you transfer it to the fresh media. Media modification also plays an important role in many species from semi-solid to liquid media is adequate. In many species, you add certain other adjuvants such as activated charcoal, PVP and so on so that it absorbs the phenols and thereafter you the next important point is that during initiation phase you keep these cultures in dark in any case they are not photosynthesizing but keeping them in the dark will prevent oxidation of phenols so let the phenol leaching be there it's not getting oxidized the explant is getting established and therefore after when you after a few days without giving a fresh cut you transfer it to fresh media for further growth another important problem associated with tissue culture is hyperhydration what is happening is that all through you are growing your cultures either in semi solid media or in liquid media the humidity inside the tube where these cultures are growing is almost 95% so anything which is grown under such high humidity levels coupled with like there is no day, there is no night, there is never ever problem of water, humidity is continuously high. 
So over there, what happens is that these plants, they develop defective leaves. There is very little epi uh, cuticle. They don't have stomatal control mechanisms for water loss control. And because of high humidity, the leaves becomes glassy, vitrified, what we call as vitrified leaves. So these plants, if they get transferred to outside conditions, natural conditions, they fail to survive. These are defective shoots, defective leaves. And therefore, in tissue culture, one's effort is how do we get rid of hyperhydration? How do we form normal leaves? There are mechanisms which have been successful. There are different ways, like you increase agar concentration in the last stage. You develop, put silica gel inside the tube so that the humidity gets reduced a bit. So there are different ways which have been successful. But let me tell you, this still remains a problem with large number of species. And if plants don't survive or show poor transplantation success, then your protocol becomes non-viable, economically non-viable. Now, the whole basis of micropropagation is to get lonely uniform plants. And you just want mirror images. You are not following even seed propagation method because you will get heterozygous plants. So anything which is little off from the main genotype structure is not what people are looking for. You want identical plants. You are very careful in choosing uh, axillary branches, axillary branching method for propagation, which is the most conservative ones. But you can still go wrong because of the continuous presence of cytokinin. Some other cells also may give rise to adventitious buds. So that's where you need a careful eye to identify between an axillary and an adventitious bud because if you miss it at one time, then you will be multiplying large number of adventitious budded plants as well. And again, this sensitivity, it varies from species to species. Now, a commercial tissue culture person would like to initiate cultures and go on multiplying them forever. Why to go back to the nature, spend energy, problem, uh, solving problems such as contamination and so on. But because of these offshoots, it is advisable that all tissue culture labs, they, be, they start with the fresh culture every year. And in few important species such as banana, we don't go beyond eight subcultures. See, if you are doing by axillary, you are going say 1 to 4, 4 to 16, 16 to 64. So it is very tempting, why not to go from 8th to ninth subculture as well, because by then you have very large number of cultures already made. So your investments are minimal in terms of further multiplication. But because of off types, you restrict and that also contribute towards the commercial viability. Your cost may become high if you are restricting number of subcultures because of offshoots. Now, ultimately, the success of micropropagation is dictated by at what price you are able to produce plants. Tissue culture plants, traditionally and even today, they remain to be expensive than the conventionally raised plants. Because what happens is that it has to be done in laboratory where infrastructure costs are very high. The thumb rule is for 1 million production annually, you have to make an investment of 1 million rupees. So if you calculate interest as well as depreciation on the building itself, it's quite huge. Second is that you require skilled manpower, which again is expensive. And your last step, which is transplantation of plants, is where you start with a conventionally raising of plant, which is seed or cutting. And there again, your mortality in the greenhouse is greater than what you otherwise face. So if you go to a nursery and they are making cuttings vegetatively, their costs are comparatively lower. You don't require that level of skill. You don't require that level of sophisticated infrastructure and therefore your costs are lower. But you have to weigh benefits versus investments. By tissue culture, you can make large number of Clonely identical disease free plants. If virus is a problem, virus elimination 
on plant basis may cost you say 10,000 rupees. But then if you're making 100,000 plants out of that plant, your cost per plant is just 10 paisa. But if you're doing vegetative propagation, then from one plant, you cannot go more than 100, 150 cuttings. So therefore, that kind of investment you cannot make. So here, tissue culture plays an important role. And it has actually brought about revolution in our country for banana. Now, you must have seen in last four or five years, the quality of banana in the market has substantially improved. Quantity of fruit has improved. Many of the non-conventional areas, such as those in UP and Bihar, they have shifted to banana. Uh, it's both selection of the right variety for that particular area, producing plants in large numbers and assuring farmer that he will at least get 30 kg per plant. They can go up to 50 depending on the agroclimatic zone, the way they can give irrigation, fertilizers and so on. But 30 is something which is guaranteed to the farmer and they are getting it. So that way it has brought about revolution. In later chapter, we will also be discussing about the national certification system for tissue culture raised plants and NCPTCP, which has been established by Department of Biotechnology, which ensures the quality plantlet reaching the farmer. So in this module, you have learned about where we are in terms of tissue culture. Not all species can be propagated. We still need research protocol, commercial commercially viable protocols for many species. There are problems which are still to be solved with important species such as recalcitrants, getting aseptic cultures from the field grown material, contamination inside the growth room, high cost of plantlet production, low survival rate in many of the species, production of offshoots uh, or the plants which are not lonely uniform, and the way we are trying to overcome by different research methodologies. You have also learned that tissue culture labs, they are to be kept almost as clean as the operation theater because you are dealing with living material here. You are dealing with aseptic cultures which are to be maintained in that condition throughout and then the plants which are produced, they are of very high quality. This is also a method to multiply disease-free material. But let me tell you what you are producing is mirror image of the mother plant. You, are, may, you can produce disease-free material, but this is not disease resistant. So resistance is something that is to be inducted by other methods. But once you have done that, then you can multiply these plants in millions of copies by tissue culture technology. Thank you.